Please welcome to the stage Rania Patrice and Dr. Kate Marvel in conversation with Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. This is so cozy, I feel like you're in my living room. I know. Hi, everyone. Um, we're here to talk about the future of coastal cities. Uh, the short answer is it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we have some incredibly um, insightful people to talk about that with. Dr. Kate Marvel, who is a climate scientist at NASA and Columbia University. Um, and Rania Patrice, who is a, a nonprofit uh, and political strategist and partner at The Wind Company. So we'll get into a little bit more of their backgrounds, so I'm not going to give you the long bios. We'll just kind of dive right in. So when we think about coastal cities, right, they're at this nexus of ocean and climate and lots of infrastructure and millions of people and a huge diversity of communities. So Kate, I'd love if you just start off by grounding us like in the science, like what is a changing climate mean for coastal cities? Sure, I feel like when we talk about climate science, a lot of times we're talking about uncertainty. We're talking about what we don't know. And as scientists, that's, we're very comfortable with uncertainty. And so sometimes we can forget to talk about the things that we are very, very certain about. So we are certain that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and we are emitting a lot of it. We are certain that the temperature of the Earth is increasing. It's warmed by about a degree Celsius since the Industrial Revolution. And we're sure that that has led to increased uh, frequency and severity of heat waves. We're also sure that warm air holds more water vapor, and so downpours are getting more intense. We're sure that rainfall patterns around the world are shifting. We're sure that droughts are getting more severe. And we're sure that sea levels are rising because the oceans themselves are getting warmer and warm water wants to expand. And ice that used to be parked on land is going into the ocean. So there's a lot of things that we're actually really sure about. So what does that mean for, say, New York City in particular, um, especially in terms of sea level rise? Like, what's, what's coming at us? A lot of times I feel like people like to think about sea level rise, like it's this very slow moving lumbering beast mm -hmm. that you can easily run away from. And I think that's kind of a misconception because when we're talking about sea level rise, we're also talking about things like storm surges. And in a warmer climate, you have warmer sea surface temperatures and sea surface temperatures are hurricane food. And so when we talk about- Sea surface temperatures are <laughs> hurricane food. In case again. someone like <laughs> didn't catch what she just rattled off there. Um, and so a lot of times when we're talking about sea level rise, we're talking about things like storm surge, something that necessarily isn't that easy to walk away from. Um, yeah. So the latest projections that I've seen are where, that we're looking at like somewhere between um, you know, one to three meters of sea level rise in the next few decades. So think about New York City with like nine more feet of water. And we're clearly unprepared in New York, like no one's really prepared for nine more feet of water. So Rania, from your expertise in um, political strategy and thinking about policy making, how does this uncertainty about like exactly when the changes are coming and exactly how much. Like, we know they're coming, it's just we don't know the date and the exact number. So how does that influence our policy response? So I first have to tell on myself, I'm the only person here who's not a doctor. <laughs> so let's just all keep that in mind. But <laughs> from a policy perspective, I think one of the big problems in the United States especially, and other countries too, is policy has not been science-based or fact-based. It's been kind of a PR strategy. And again, telling on myself as somebody who does a lot of PR strategy, that's obviously problematic because of all of the things that Kate <laughs> said and all of the things that Ayana's gonna share. It's not, um, we're not in a place where we can sort of be gaming our political strategy to fit what we think folks wanna hear because at the end of the day, the reality is coming, whether we're, we're ready for it or not. And if we don't do something, this whole like sort of trying to, like, like I said, 
focus on it from a PR perspective. It's just, it's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. it, it might be inconvenient, it might be a struggle, it's, but it, we have to do something. Are we participating in bad PR right now by talking about the ocean, especially in New York City, as this monster that we only care about when it can rise up and, and flood our subways? You know, I know you work a lot in ocean conservation. And you I'm a marine biologist. That's, that's, my, that's my doctor. This is why she's like, question for the moderator. Exactly. So, you know, do you think that by talking about the ocean only in terms of the bad things it can do to us, do you think we are now contributing to bad PR? Um, I, think, I think what people don't really often think about when we think about climate change is that the ocean is a part of our climate system, right? So the ocean has already absorbed a third of the CO2 that we've emitted and the ocean has already absorbed 93% of the excess heat that we've trapped, um, which has changed the ocean entirely. So the ocean is getting more acidic because it's absorbing all this carbon dioxide, which means it's harder for things with skeletons and shells to grow. Um, obviously, the ocean is getting a lot warmer, which means that fish are moving towards the poles. So here in New York, there used to be a lot of lobster in Long Island Sound. Now there really aren't any lobster here, and they're in Maine, and even they're leaving Maine and going to Canada. So we're seeing these like massive shifts, which have implications for um, food security, for safety along the coast, obviously, in terms of storms and sea level, and also like really big economic impacts. And those are both to your PR question, there's both a pro and a con, right? Like the ocean can feed us and provide us like amazing recreational opportunities and really support what we call the blue economy. Um, and there's an opportunity to really expand like offshore wind and renewables there. And so I think we need to think of the ocean as part of the solution. Absolutely, like it can provide us this wealth of things that we also have to take care of it. And I think that's something, I'm, I grew up in Brooklyn and I never thought of New York as a coastal city, even though we have almost 600 miles of coastline because you're just like, oh, concrete jungle. So I think that's the first step when thinking about coastal cities is acknowledging that we have this very dynamic relationship with the ocean. And I think also just for, again, from a kind of removing all the labels and all of the things that we attach to all of this work, I mean, who doesn't love spending time at the ocean? Raise your hand if, if you don't like the ocean. Does anyone like the Does beach? Does anybody <laughs> like the beach? Um, no one in here likes the beach. There we go. Everybody All right. right. OK. <laughs> We'd also like to keep the beach, which is right. a real risk with sea level rise, which is crazy. So yeah. I'd love to ask you from like this, this perspective of like solutions that we can put into place, given what we know is changing. A lot of people are like, let's build a wall. Like, I'm not a fan of walls in general as a policy <laughs> solution, but um, what does that mean for a response for cities, like this, this fortification, like we can hold back the entire ocean sort of techno-utopian mentality, sort of like where does that lead us? I, that was very much a leading question. Yeah, I I was, I was like, <laughs> it's, it's just like so many things when we're talking about um, the ocean or climate change or environmental justice, it's not a solution. <laughs> We're not actually getting to the root of the problem. And I'm sorry to laugh, but it's just so ridiculous, right? Because at the end of the day, nature will win over a wall. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. So um, I don't think it actually, we have to start getting to the root of the problem. And you know, we were talking about this a little bit before. We have this tendency to not want to be inconvenienced when the reality is, you know, get over it. If we all just need to get things over are it. Going to yeah, change. things are going to change. And it doesn't mean that your life is over and it doesn't mean that things have to be horrible, but these small things that we can do in our everyday lives actually have a great impact. So, Kate, along those lines, like where the science and the, the policy intersect to think about solutions, sort of how do you think about? Um, sort of, is there, a, is there like a neutral option? Like if we want to be like politically neutral in applying these things, like what, what does that look like to you? That's a really good question because I feel like I've been really wrestling with that aspect of my training as a scientist. Um, we are told that science and politics, science isn't political. And of course, politics is just how we decide who gets what. And the response to climate change is basically going to be some combination of mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And politics is the way we collectively decide 
who gets what and, and in what proportion those things are meted out. And so for me, and this is a really evolving process, but for me as a scientist, it's kind of this realization that climate change doesn't just happen on one of my computer models. Climate change happens in the world that we live in and climate change happens in the world that we've built for it. And so I think that's why I'm really happy to be here with you because thinking about how we solve these problems, because climate change is not a scientific problem. Climate change affects every single one of us. And so we need science to be part of the solution, but we also need all of these other areas of human expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think we do. So let's unpack just a little bit more this trade-off you're discussing or these different elements of um, you describe as adaptation, mitigation, and suffering. I think we all know what suffering is, but like, help us understand adaptation and mitigation in the context of climate change. So mitigation, when I say mitigation, I mean basically taking the stuff that's warming the planet out of the atmosphere or not putting it in there in the first place. That's something that I am not very qualified to talk about as a physicist. I can tell you what carbon dioxide does once you put it in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but the best way to not do that, I think, is kind of above my pay grade. Um, when we talk about adaptation. You gotta get you a higher pay grade. I gotta get a higher pay grade, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but when I think about adaptation, you know, a lot of times people think adaptation sounds kind of benign. You know, it's building a seawall, it's building a levee. And sometimes when we think about adaptation, we are talking about something like managed retreat. We're talking about something like people used to live in this place. People used to make memories in this place. People used to raise their families in this place, and now they're not going to be able to live there anymore. And so managed retreat is kind of a kind of anodyne term for what we're actually really talking about. So I want to get back to managed retreat, but first, Rania, this is like exactly in your pay grade to think <laughs> through like what are the what are sort of like the complexities of the policy that would help us think through this. So as someone who helped to craft the Off Fossil Fuels Act, which was in some sense a significant precursor to this Green New Deal concept, how have you thought about what it would look like to build policy around the scientific realities? So this kind of comes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning where the Off Act was specifically centered around the science and the research. And it wasn't centered around what person X in such district was going to think. It was very, very intentional. It was also very, very collaborative with the science, the climate, and the environmental justice community. And um, it, it, it's tough. It's a really hard time right now, again, especially in the United States, other parts of the world as well, when we're talking about the politics of it all because no one wants to talk about the really hard thing. No, and and that is in, that you see that in policy. Mm -hmm. And we're in a place right now, unfortunately, where incrementalism is not going to work. We're, not, we're past that time. I think everybody can agree to that, I'm not being a scientist, but we can, we can all agree. Big changes are coming. Yes, and they we have need a to, response. absolutely. And so I think, and actually this is sort of the perfect segue from what Kate was saying in that we have to humanize all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to be able, so often we think of climate change or, or the, the changes that are happening, the, the sea level rising, the, the temperature rising as this like over there, it's happening over there, it's not affecting me or my life. And so to Kate's point, telling those stories, those very, very real human stories, are, it's one of the biggest steps I think we have to take in order to push the policy makers, the mm. politicians, to make the tough decisions and do the things that have to be done as yeah. hard as they might be. So in the context of managed retreat, which is this sort of newly emerging term, managed retreat or planned retreat, thinking about how do we actually move away from the coastline, move away from places that we know are inevitably going to be inundated within the next few years or a few decades. Um, and a friend of ours recently shared that she was swimming offshore of her family's home in South Carolina and felt concrete under her feet because that used to be land. Mm. So we're, this is like a current reality. This is not just something that's happening 
happening in the future. And so the term is problematic because people it's so defeatist, right? Like we're retreating as in we have lost. And so there was a joke on Twitter the other day. Some guy was like, we could call it advancing in the other direction. Then maybe people would like be down to think about this because the more we like entrench ourselves, right, in like continuing construction on the coast, like the number of cranes in Miami Beach building new yeah. high rises is like, that's problematic, right? Because we start to invest in protecting our investments um, and then we're not able to make this transition. So what you both are raising um, from both like a political strategy perspective and a scientific perspective is the need to tell different stories to help us grapple with like the reality that's coming and that we actually need to respond to it. So um, Kate is a columnist at Scientific American. She has a column called Hot Planet. And Rania has done a ton of work, not just with political campaigns, but also with social movements, talking, figuring out narratives that break through. So I'd love to hear from both of you, like what do you think is missing in terms of the mainstream narratives on how we in general and coastal cities in particular might think about how to get to a future that's livable for all of us? Well, so I think um, I, I do a, a lot of work with a lot of young people. And aside from the fact that they're exhausting because they have so much energy <laughs> and I just don't anymore, they are so brilliant because their BS meter is like off the charts. They just don't, they don't parse words. They don't care what they're supposed to do. Um, which is really inspiring for a political hack like myself to just be part of what they're doing. And so, and I think that they have really captured something. Yesterday at the UN Youth Climate Summit, um, Sunrise Movement and Zero Hour and a bunch of other youth-led climate organizations announced that they were no longer going to be called Generation Z because that is the last letter of the alphabet and they are not going to be the last generation. Right? They're so awesome. And they're going to now be called Generation GND. For the Green for New the Deal. For the Green New Deal. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to sit back here and eat my popcorn and let y'all do your thing. <laughs> but I think we That's really, a really important flip of the script, right? And, and I think that is so important because, the, to your point, there is so much defeatist language out there mm -hmm. when we need to be saying, nope, we're taking, I'm from Texas, y'all, I'm sorry, taking the bull by the horns and we're <laughs> going to, we're going to actually do something. And these young people are not going to let that go. And so honestly, I think we can sort of let them take the lead in a lot of ways and follow their lead because they are so fearless mm -hmm. and they're hitting the nail on the head. And so much of it is a narrative shift and telling the stories and, and demanding the change. And they're so amazing. Kate, what that. do you think? I feel for a really long time there's only been one story that gets told about climate change, which is maybe it's real, maybe it's not, mm. and it's real. Um, <laughs> so You heard it here, hopefully <laughs> not first, folks. Um, I'm sick of that story. Like, I never liked it in the first place. But now I feel like there's another story that's emerging, which is we're all doomed, we're all doomed, there's nothing we can do. And I don't like that story either. And so I just want, I want a choice of more stories. I'm not happy with those two. Let's tell more. Amazing. <laughs> um, so we have just a few seconds left. Do we want to talk? Um, do you, I know that you wanted to cover, like, the cost of doing nothing. Like that's, that's what's at stake when we just constantly debate what to do and don't do anything. So as we close, let's, let's hear your thoughts on that. I feel like change is coming whether we want it or not. Doing nothing means we're committing to absolutely massive changes in the climate and the way we live. And so we have a really precious opportunity here to create the change that we want to see. Do you have any last thoughts you want to share? Um, I, I think the young people will win is my parting thought. So let's just follow <laughs> along with them and, and be uh, allies and advocates and, and really show up and, and help tell these stories because they're out there. Yeah, at the, at the march yesterday, I had the great privilege of speaking and I had a similar message to share, which was that youthful moral clarity is not naivete. Mm -hmm. And so we, there are some things that are right and there are some things that are wrong. We think about who's getting impacted and the justice elements of that. So um, thank you. This has been such a treat to be in conversation with you. Please thank our experts with me. <laughs>